Approach, please.
Hi, Dr. DeMarti. We were just finishing up talking about the MCMI, right? Yes. Okay. And with regard to the M MCMI that Dr. Samuels uh, conducted, you're aware that the there was um, under access, well, you talked yesterday about access one and access two diagnoses, right? Yes. And under access one, according to the MCMI, the diagnosis was none other specified, right? In addition, there was more access and they were rule outs. They were not diagnoses. Anxiety disorder, right? Anxiety disorder, I believe it was NOS. Right. And what does NOS stand for? Not otherwise specified. Okay. So, uh, in other words, um, so they're talking, so the diagnosis was anxiety with uh, nothing specific with it, right? It's anxiety disorder NOS. Right. And then for access to, that's where we talk about personality disorders, isn't it? Yes, but you missed the other access one disorder that was listed. Right, but I'm talking okay. about access two now. Okay. Okay, so um, access two uh, is talking about personality disorders, yes. right? And with access two, uh, the, their diagnosis from the MCMI test comes out as diagnosis or condition deferred, right? Yes. That means there is no diagnosis. That's not correct. Judge, judge the same issue and if we may approach. 
Okay, Dr. DeMarte, we're talking about the MCMI, right? Yes. Okay, so let's see if we can get through this. Your, um, the MCMI ultimately produces a diagnosis, doesn't it? Rule out diagnoses, things to consider. Okay, so things to consider, and they talk about access one and access two. Yes. And in access one, um, with regard to MCMI, and also what Dr. Samuels found with regard to his other reports, you're aware that he diagnosed access one as post traumatic stress, right? Yes. And he found it to be acute. Yes. And you're aware that as under access one, he has anxiety disorder, none other specified, NOS. He does where? Under access one. On what, what are you referring to? Are His you referring report. To? Yeah, May I approach? Sure. May I approach? Yes. And under access two, you're aware that uh, based on the MCMI, the diagnosis was personality disorder NOS. Yes. So there was no diagnosis for borderline, right? It was personality dis NOS indicating that there was the presence of a personality disorder. Right. It's not specifically indicating borderline, is it? Yeah, that's correct. Now, you conducted your own TSI, didn't you? Yes. And you said you hand scored it? Yes. So when you hand score it, then you don't get a computer printout, obviously, right? Correct. And do you have your hand scores with you today? Yes. Can you pull those out, please? Uh, can I have them? I'm going to mark them. What do you want? The raw data? Well, I want the information that you would get once you score it. So you want the scale scores? scores? Mm -hmm. It's only this side of the paper. Page? Yes. All right, I'm handing you what's been marked as Exhibit 28. This is your hand scoring, right, of the TSI, part of the TSI scales, right? Yes. Okay, which scales are those? Which scales? Well, is that, is that all the scales that you look at under the TSI? Yes. Okay. Uh, and you have part of the worksheet you show a raw score, right? Oh, on here? Yes. Yes. And then you also show what the T-score is. Yes, that's correct. And the T-score is what you plot into a graph. Yes. And the T-score is what we've kind of been talking about this morning is when it gets plotted into a graph, you're looking at that number, whether or not it's clinically significant. Yes. Okay. And uh, this particular TSI test, when did you give it? August 12th, 2011. Of what 2011? All right, and you gave the TSI-1, right? Yes. Uh, but at that time, the TSI-2 was available, wasn't it? Just recently had been put out. So it was available? Yes. And the TSI-2 is the more updated version, isn't it? Yes. And uh, was there a benefit to you to use an outdated test? 
to use an outdated test? Yes, to use the TSI-1 had, versus the TSI-2. There was no benefit. It had just been released. Okay, so... So there, there was, was no benefit to it. There was no benefit to using the old one. Right. Okay, but you still chose to use the old one. The other one wasn't available to me. You just said it was released. It was released, but it wasn't available to me. So, in other words, if you wanted to, you couldn't go and get it? I could, the agency that I was working at had not purchased it, and it wasn't something, it, there's this time span of psychologists that were given to update our test, and given that it was just released, I was well within that time span. Okay, and so the agency you were working with was Bayless, right? That's correct. And let's see, August 12th of 2011, this puts you about a year out after getting your license, right? Yes. And so a year out after getting your license, you're conducting this TSI test, and you're using you didn't ask Bayless to go and get the updated one? No. So you were just content using the one that has been revised, the one that had not been revised? It had, the other one had just been released. Right, so you were content yes. using the one that yes, was I not revised. Yes, I thought this was adequate. All right. Um, the, when you gave the rat and the waste, though, you used the updated versions of those, didn't you? Yes. Same thing with the MMPI, you used the updated version? Yes. Okay. Which had been up, out for several years. Okay, but those were all updated for you? Yes. All right, let's look at the clinical scales on the TSI. Uh, there were several elevated scales, weren't there? Yes. And one of the scales that's elevated is AA. Can you tell us what that means? Related to anxiety. Okay, and uh, she was elevated on that, wasn't she? Yes. And the... And the actual, the clinical elevation on this test is actually at 65, not 75, right? That's correct. Okay, so things above 65 is clinically elevated, right? Yes. And so clinically elevated was anxious arousal. That's what you were saying relates to anxiety? Yes. And you also found that depression was uh, also elevated, right? Yes. And depression was elevated to 78. Is that what you got? Yes. And we also have DA. What is that? Can I reference my notes? Sure, if you need to. Sure. That's the avoidance subscale. I'm sorry, it's the what? Avoidance subscale. Okay, defensive avoidance, does yes. that sound right? All right, and so defensive avoidance, and that's avoiding what? What is that talking about? Avo avoidance in general. The TSI doesn't specifically identify a specific trauma, so it's just general avoidance type of behaviors. Okay, and so under general avoidance type of behaviors, it's elevated at 66, right? Is that what you got? Yes. Okay, and then we have DIS. What's that? Are you, do you need to refer to your notes? Yes, I'm referring to my notes. I'll okay. let, I should let you know that. Dissociation. Okay. And so dissociation, that was also elevated, wasn't it? Yes. And that was elevated to 73? Correct. And then we also have SC. What's that? And if, are you I'm referring, referring to my notes. Okay. Sexual concerns. All right. And that was elevated to 80, right? Yes. And then we have DSB. Just, do you know what that is? It's another sexual scale. Okay. And that was elevated, wasn't it? Yes. And we also have ISR. Can you tell us what that is? It's related to identity. Okay. Impaired self-reference? Yes. Okay, so does that have to do with when somebody does not view themselves in a, a positive manner? In, impaired self-reference is self-concept, kind of related to the idea that I was speaking about yesterday. Okay. So uh, you'd, agree that it, you'd agree that it also can mean low self-image, right? It's more related to self-concept. So not related at so all to self-image? There's some overlap. Okay. And so there's some overlap with self-image and self-esteem, right? Yes. And this one was also elevated to 83, wasn't it? Yes. And the elevation of that means that there is a uh, impaired self-reference, right? Yes. Or that she has a lower self-image or lower self-esteem. Those overlapping ideas, right? And identity confusion. You're, so you're Self-concept and identity. So impaired self-reference also has to do with identity. Yes, self, okay. which is self-concept. All right. And the scale, when it goes up to 83, as high as that, it doesn't tell you um, identity or self-image, right? Correct. It doesn't parse it apart. 
and one of these on here, we also have IE. Do you know what that is? I'll reference my notes. Sure. Intrusive experiences. And do you have that on your scales there? Do I have what? The IE. Is it showing up there? As an item, yes. Yes, okay. All right, and what's the number that you get on that? 61 is the T. Okay, is the T score, right? Yes. All right. And so that, that falls just below clinically significant, doesn't it? So, yes, it falls below. Okay. And so based on the work that you've told us about that you've done with um, some of domestic violence women who've suffered from domestic violence, you'd be aware then that a lot of times battered women suffer from low self-image, don't they? Yes. And yesterday you talked to us about whether or not Jody, you personally believed Jody exhibited any behavior of low self-image, and you said no, right? Right. But this test result speaks differently, doesn't it? No. Well, it doesn't, you just agreed with me that it doesn't parse it out, right? With regard to the impaired self-reference. Right, it, it refers to both. Okay. Uh, one of the other scales on this, on this TSI is AI. Do you know what that is? Mm-hmm, What's yes. that? I'm gonna refer to my notes. It's anger irritability. All right, and what's the T-score on that one? 43. All right, and 43, that's not clinically significant, is it? That's correct. Uh, yesterday you talked to us about uh, Jody's floating profile being one that is uh, having violent, prone to violent outbursts or anger, right? You're confusing two terms. Violent outbursts, you said, right? Um, you're confusing floating profile with that interpretation. Okay. Well, let's not talk about floating profile for a second. Okay. One of the things that you said with regard to Jody's personality traits is that there would be um, a tendency for violent outbursts, right? Yes. Okay. And, uh, but here, when we're talking on the TSI scale with anger and irritability, she falls below clinically significant, right? That's correct. And when you hand score these, do you get uh, the composite scales? That's what you're looking at, just the T scales. Okay. Well, do you get the, also the summary scales? I'm talking about summary scales. This is all that you get. Okay. So you didn't do, so you didn't do anything with regard to the summary scales groups. There's, there's three group that it's grouped into three different groups. Not in the original TSI. Okay. So you didn't do that then? It's not part of the scoring. Summary, TSI summary scales are not part of the scoring? Well, you're confusing terms again. So what this, what's on this, what you're looking at there is everything that's included in the scoring. Okay. So, so that's, I don't think I'm confusing anything. I'm asking you about summary scales. Did you not, do you not have any TSI summary scales? I have an question. Uh, Jane asked it, what, I don't think I, overall, you may answer. If, if you're, you're referring, are you referring to the summed raw scores? No. I'm that would be a summary scale. So that's not what you're referring to. No, I'm talking about the summary scales of trauma, self, and dysphoria. Do you have those? No. Okay, so you didn't do those. Those aren't part of the scoring. Okay. So then you don't have any significance with regard to the scales, the summary of trauma, the summary of self, and the summary of dysphoria, right? It's not part of the scoring. Okay. Um, and the TSI or trauma test, that is a test that can indicate PTSD, right? It can indicate PTSD. Because trauma is a part of PTSD? Yes. And based on these test scores, we're seeing a, a elevated anxiety, right? Yes. And elevated depression, right? Yes. And elevated defensive avoidance? Yes. And so based on those items, don't those items also speak to PTSD? Those are symptoms that can be seen in PTSD and in personality disorders. So they can be seen in PTSD? Yes, they can. All right. So you talked to us a little bit about your experience with domestic violence, right? Yes. And that some of these patients that have come into you 
since you were training in 2004 and then after you've been licensed that these patients have had issues with domestic violence in their lives, right? Yes. Um, <clears throat> during this time that you're seeing these people, you're not, I guess there's, there's one part in your CV where you specifically talk for two months that you're interviewing domestic uh, violence women, right? Women who suffered from domestic violence, right? Which aspect of the CV are you talking about? I'm talking about the two months that you spent doing the unstructured interviews. Those were for perpetrators. Those, oh, those were, not, were perpetrators. Yes, I think what you're referring to is back to my to research that was done at Michigan State University. Okay, and so all right, so let's talk the research that you did. That's when you're doing interviews of women who have had who had been some type of had some type of domestic violence, right? Yes. Okay, and then you spent two months with perpetrators. That would be another instance. Yes. yes. Right. Okay, uh, and other than that, in your um, CV, you don't specifically talk about assessing domestic violence, right? Correct. And during these times when you're either doing research or um, other than the two months that you spent with batterers, you're not assessing domestic violence relationships, right? That's incorrect. So you're assessing domestic violence relationships? Frequently. And what are you doing to assess them? It's several times when people come into me either for therapy or for evaluation. Part of my job is to determine whether they've been exposed to domestic violence and secondly, whether it's actually had a negative impact on them or not. Okay, so you're talking to them and that, how is it that you're assessing them for this? By asking them questions related to domestic violence and related symptoms in addition to all the other questions that I ask about their life. Okay, and what research is it that you rely on to form the knowledge to make assessments regarding domestic violence relationships? Can you say that again? Sure. What research is it that you rely on to form the knowledge to assess domestic violence relationships? There's an, are you, if you're talking about a specific diagnosis, or are you talking about whether it's present or not? I'm talking about the research that you rely on to form the knowledge to ask these people about their domestic violence situations and to ultimately form an opinion about what type of relationship they're in. Sure, I rely on Lenore Walker's research. There's okay. a number of different researchers out there that talk about domestic violence and how it um, well, causes... Besides, besides Lenore Walker, who else do you rely on? There's no particular author off the top of my head that I tend to turn to all the time in terms of domestic violence specifically. So can you name at least one other than Lenore Walker? Not off the top of my head. All right, and so uh, Lenore Walker... Um, let's see. That's what you talked about yesterday, right? Yes. Can you tell us some... Um, okay, so with re are there any books that you've read recently with regard to domestic violence that you rely on? Recently? Yes. I've referred back to Lenore's recent um, book. In, in, I think it was in 2009 was when it was last published. It's the third edition. Okay. So other than Lenore Walker, any other books that you've read with regard to specialties in domestic violence? Yes. What are those? I don't have the titles off the top of my head. Okay, so it's not something that you know off the top of your head. Though. Correct. And what about journals? Do you yes. receive any journals with regard to domestic violence? I don't receive any journals because I have access to them online. Okay. So which ones do you access online that are specifically made for domestic violence? I access journals. I don't, I mean journal articles. I don't access specific journals. So if there's a patient that I'm seeing that is suffering with a particular disorder or problem, I'll look up research associated with that and just using a broad database. So then are you telling me that, that regularly speaking, you don't keep up with domestic violence and the new research in the field by regularly reading domestic violence journals, the articles contained in these special journals? No, that's not what I'm saying. So you do then regularly keep up with domestic violence journals? You're talking about journals and I'm talking about research articles. Those are very different things. Well, I'm talking about the articles contained in the journals. Right, so I read articles frequently. Right, okay. So I understand that you read articles frequently. What I'm talking about is are you reading articles frequently that are contained and written especially for domestic violence? Yes, I don't know the exact journals because as I'm reading the article, I don't look up and reference what journal this specifically came from. Okay. I just know it's peer reviewed. Okay, can you give us any of the names of the articles that you've read recently? I don't commit those to memory. Okay, so when was the last time you read one of these? Last week. Okay, and you don't remember the name of it? I don't commit these things to memory. I have a full patient load that I see on a weekly basis. I, that's not something that's important to me to keep the title of it. 
Okay. Um, and you don't remember the journal that you got it from? I didn't get it from a journal again. I got it from a broad database. Right, right, right. But ultimately, they're published in a journal, aren't they? Yes. Okay. And you don't remember the name of the journal that this was article that you read last week was published in? I did not look at the journal. Okay. Correct. Now, you told us yesterday that in your experience, in your knowledge, you don't believe that Jody is a battered woman, right? I believe there's inconsistencies in her report. You told us yesterday, that's not what I asked you. You told us yesterday that based on your knowledge and experience, you don't believe that Jody fits a battered woman, right? Battered women syndrome, correct. Okay. And so, and you relied on, when you were talking about that with us yesterday, you relied on work that's been done by Lenore Walker, right? That's correct. And that's something that we just talked about today, Lenore Walker. Correct. Uh, and the work that you relied on with regard to Lenore Walker, she first published articles when? Do you remember her first book? I believe it was back in 70s. 79? 71. 71, sometime in the 70s. Okay. And so if you're familiar with domestic violence, and then you would also be familiar with the fact that, that there had been many revisions and additional research done after Lenore Walker published her book, right? The original book, yes. Okay. It's very controversial. Yes, and, and in fact, there's been lots of other research done with regard to domestic violence and battered women since then, hasn't there? Yes. The, the book that we're talking about being published by Lenore Walker, that's where you get these six criteria from, right? Yes. And that's the one that we're talking about being published in the 70s, right? No. She came out with the six criteria back then, didn't she? No. No? You think she came out with it later than that? In the book, they indicated that because there's been so much research that's done on this topic, mm -hmm. that they've formulated new criteria to capture, that there's now some sort of criteria to capture what is battered women's syndrome. For many years, there was no criteria. So wait, so you're, t you're testifying that there is specific criteria, that Lenore Walker would agree that there is specific criteria to profile a battered woman. Is that what you're saying? No, you're okay, changing my I'm words. Okay, then, then tell me what you're saying. There, there is criteria or no? There's criteria that's listed in her book that identify the presence of battered women's syndrome. Okay. That she identifies. Again, this is not the DSM. This is just a culmination of research that's come with this criteria. And yesterday you talked specifically about six criteria, right? Yes. And those six criteria, you're telling me that that was not published in her original book? I'm not aware if it was. I know that in her most updated book, that's what was published, in, and it relied on research that was more recent. Her most updated book publishes the same six criteria. Is that what you're saying? No, I just said to you that I'm not aware if it was published before. The way that it's written in this book indicates that it's based on new research right. and that this is new criteria. OK. So the new criteria based on the new research, um, and new research done by other people, right? By a number of people. Right. Do you know who Marianne Dutton is? Yes, I've heard, heard of Dutton. Who's Marianne Dutton? I believe a researcher. Right, and tell us what her research has shown. I don't know off the top of my head. Well, you know that she's a leading researcher in battered women's syndrome, right? I don't know off the top of my head. Okay, well, then perhaps you know that she has done updated research with regard to battered women's sy syndrome, right? It sounds like you have some information about that. But do you know that? I'm not aware of her name specifically, as I highlighted earlier. I don't commit that to memory. Okay. Well, then maybe do you commit to memory that the updated research with regard to battered women's syndrome actually takes a global, global view at it now? Are you aware of that? What do you mean by global view? Uh, well, that it shows that the more likely diagnosis for battered women's syndrome is PTSD. Are oh, you aware I, of that? I'm very aware that PTSD and battered women's syndrome have been used together. Yes. Okay. Uh, and. Are you aware then that with the updated research, even Lenore Walker isn't using those six criteria anymore? Are you aware of that? Those six criteria include, the P include PTSD. Are you aware that Lenore Walker does not even use those six criteria anymore? That seems inaccurate. So you're based not aware on the criteria. of that. That doesn't sound accurate. Okay, so you disagree then? Yes. And you've never met Lenore Walker, have you? No. Okay. Um, since you have seem to be familiar with her work then, are you familiar that Lenore Walker actually, her updated research takes the 
approach takes a trauma-informed approach rather than using the six criteria. No, I was not aware of that. But yet, not being aware of this information, and you don't consider yourself an expert in domestic violence, do you? I'm an expert as a clinical psychologist. Well, clinical psychologist is kind of a big general area, isn't it? Correct. Okay, so you're an expert in clinical psychology? Yes. Okay, and so, but you don't consider yourself an expert in domestic violence, do you? I've had a lot of experience in domestic violence and working with people with domestic violence. It determines, it depends on how you define expert. Do you define yourself as an expert of domestic violence? I would not call myself an expert in domestic violence specifically. Okay, so you are not an expert in domestic violence according to you? I have a lot of experience with it, but I wouldn't put that term on because I think it's an important term. It's so you very would, specific. Right, so you I would, would not. not characterize yourself as an expert in domestic violence? Specifically, yes. Okay. In fact, part of what you talked to us yesterday is, is the fact that your <coughs> belief that just because a woman does not go see a doctor if her husband beats her, or if she doesn't call the police because her husband hits her, somehow to you, that is a data point that is going to be suggestive that maybe it didn't happen, right? It's a data point, yes. That to you, in this particular case, it suggested to you that it didn't happen, right? Yes, and if it was there, it would suggest that it did happen. So with battered women, based on your experience, you're expecting battered women to report then, right? No, not all the time. Well, then you're aware that they minimize, right? Yes. You're aware that they oftentimes don't report. Yes, I am. And you're aware that oftentimes they don't call the police when they're hit by their loved ones. I am aware of that. And you're aware that they don't go to the doctor when they're hurt by their loved ones. Yes. You talked a little bit about yesterday about the fight or flight syndrome, right? Yes. Okay. And being a psychologist, you know about the brain, right? Correct. And that's what you study, right? Correct. Uh, the fight or flight syndrome, that's a physiological, it causes a physiological response, doesn't it? Yes. It's something that we can't control necessarily. Yes. Right? Uh, and we talked, you talked, just one sec. All right, we'll take the noon recess a little early and we'll start early. So, ladies and gentlemen, please be back at 1.20, 1.20 from lunch. Please remember the admonition. You are excused.